to Valentine and so Tom found himself being sent off to do gut duty while all the other apprentices were busy celebrating the capture of Salt Hook. After a long, embarrassing lecture in Pomeroy's office, disobedience, Natsworthy, striking a senior apprentice, what would your poor parents have thought? He trudged over to Tottenham Court Road station and waited for a down elevator. When it came, it was crowded. The seats in the upper compartment were packed with arrogant-looking men and women from the Guild of Engineers, the most powerful of the four great guilds which ran London. They gave Tom the creeps. With their bald heads and those long white rubber coats they wore, so he stayed standing in the lower section, where the stern face of the Lord Mayor stared down at him from posters saying, Movement is life, help the Guild of Engineers keep London moving. Down and down went the elevator, stopping at all the familiar stations Backerloo, High Holborn, Low Holborn, Bethnal Green, and at every stop another crowd of people surged into the car, squashing him against the back wall until it was almost a relief to reach the bottom and step out into the noise and bustle of the gut. The gut was where London dismantled the towns it caught. A stinking sprawl of yards and factories between the jaws and the central engine rooms. Tom loathed it. It was always noisy, and it was staffed by workers from the lower tiers, who were dirty and frightening, and convicts from the deep gut prisons, who were worse. The heat down there always gave him a headache, and the sulfurous air made him sneeze, and the flicker of the argon globes which lit the walkways hurt his eyes. But the Guild of Historians always made sure some of its staff were on hand when a town was being digested. And tonight he would have to join them and go about reminding the tough old foreman of the gut that any books and antiques aboard the new catch were the rightful property of his guild and that history was just as important as bricks and iron and coal. He fought his way out of the elevator terminus and hurried towards the Guild of Historians' warehouse through tubular corridors lined with green ceramic tiles and across metal catwalks high above the fiery gulfs of the digestion yards. Far below him he could see Salt Hook being torn to pieces. It looked tiny now, dwarfed by the vastness of London. Big yellow dismantling machines were crawling around it on tracks and swinging above it on cranes and clambering over it on hydraulic spider legs. Its wheels and axles had already been taken off and work was starting on the chassis. Circular saws as big as ferris wheels fit into the deck plates, throwing up plumes of sparks. Great blasts of heat came billowing from furnaces and smelters. And before he had gone twenty paces Tom could feel the sweat starting to soak through the armpits of his black uniform tunic. But when he finally reached the warehouse, things started to look a bit brighter. Salt Hook had not had a museum or a library and the small heaps that had been salvaged from the town's junk shops were already being packed into crates for their journey up to Tier 2. If he was lucky he might be allowed to finish early and catch the end of the celebrations. He wondered which guildsman was in charge tonight. If it was old Arkengarth or Dr. Weymouth he was doomed. They always made you work your whole shift whether there was anything to do or not. If it was Potty Pewtertide or Miss Plyme he might be all right. But as he hurried towards the supervisor's office he began to realize that someone much more important than any of them was on gut duty tonight. There was a bug parked outside the office. A sleek black bug with the guild's emblem painted on its engine cowling, much too flash for any of the usual staff. Two men in the livery of high-ranking guild staff stood waiting beside it. They were rough-looking types, in spite of their plush clothes, and Tom knew at once who they were, Pusey and Gench. The reformed air pirates who had been the head historian's faithful servants for twenty years and who piloted the thirteenth-floor elevator whenever he flew off on an expedition. Valentine is here, Tom thought, and tried not to stare as he hurried past them up the steps. Thaddeus Valentine was Tom's hero, a former scavenger who had risen to become London's most famous archaeologist and also its head historian, much to the envy and disgust of people like Pomeroy. Tom kept a picture of them tacked to the dormitory wall above his bunk, and he had read his books, Adventures of a Practical Historian in America Deserta, Across the Dead Continent with Gun. 
camera and airship until he knew them by heart. The proudest moment of his life had been when he was 12 and Valentine had come down to present the apprentices' end-of-year prizes, including the one Tom had won for an essay on identifying fake antiquities. He still remembered every word of the speech the great man had made. Never forget, apprentices, that we historians are the most important guild in our city. We don't make as much money as the merchants, but we create knowledge which is worth a great deal more. We may not be responsible for steering London like the navigators, but where would the navigators be if we hadn't preserved the ancient maps and charts? And as for the Guild of Engineers, just remember that every machine they have ever developed is based on some fragment of old tech, ancient high technology that our museum keepers have preserved where our archaeologists have dug up all. Tom had been able to manage by way of reply was a mumbled. Thank you, sir, before he scurried back to his seat, so it never occurred to him that Valentine would remember him. But when he opened the door of the supervisor's office the great man looked up from his desk and grinned. It's Natsworthy, isn't it? The apprentice who's so good at spotting fakes. I'll have to watch my step tonight, or you'll find me out. It wasn't much of a joke, but it broke through the awkwardness that usually existed between an apprentice and a senior guildsman. And Tom relaxed enough to stop hovering on the threshold and step right inside, holding out his note from Pomeroy. Valentine jumped to his feet and came striding over to take it. He was a tall, handsome man of nearly forty with a mane of silver-flecked black hair and a trim black beard. His gray, mariner's eyes twinkled with humor, and on his forehead a third eye, the guild mark of the historian, the blue eye that looks backwards into time, seemed to wink as he raised a quizzical eyebrow. Fighting, eh? And what did Apprentice Melifant do to deserve a black eye? He was saying stuff about my mum and dad, sir, mumbled Tom. I see, the explorer nodded, watching the boy's face. Instead of telling him off he asked, Are you the son of David and Rebecca Natsworthy? Yes, sir, admitted Tom. But I was only six when the big tilt happened. I mean, I don't really remember them. Valentine nodded again, and his eyes were sad and kind. They were good historians, Thomas. I hope you'll follow in their footsteps. Oh, yes, sir, said Tom. I mean minus one hopes the two, he thought of his poor mom and dad killed when part of Cheapside collapsed onto the tier below. Nobody had ever spoken like that about them before, and he felt his eyes filling with tears. He felt as if he could tell Valentine anything, anything at all. And he was just on the point of saying how much he missed his parents and how lonely and boring it was being a third-class apprentice when a wolf walked into the office. It was a very large wolf, and white, and it appeared through the door that led out into the stockroom. As soon as it saw Tom it came running towards him, bearing its yellow fangs. Ah, he shrieked, leaping onto a chair. A wolf, oh, do behave, a girl's voice said, and a moment later the girl herself was there, bending over the beast and tickling the soft white ruff of fur under its chin. The fierce amber eyes closed happily, and Tom heard its tail whisking against her clothes. Don't worry, she laughed, smiling up at him. He's a lamb, I mean, he's a wolf really. But he's as gentle as a lamb, Tom, said Valentine, his eyes twinkling with amusement. Meet my daughter Catherine, and dog, dog, Tom came down off his chair. Feeling foolish and still a little scared, he had thought the brute must have escaped from the zoo in Circle Park. It's a long story, said Valentine. Catherine lived on the raft city of Puerto Angeles until she was five. Then her mother died and she was sent to live with me. I brought Dog back for her as a present from my expedition to the ice wastes, but Catherine couldn't speak very much English in those days and she'd never heard of wolves. So when she first saw him she said, Dog, and it sort of stuck. He's perfectly tame, the girl promised, still smiling up at Tom. Father found him when he was just a cub. He had to shoot the mother, but he hadn't the heart to finish poor dog off. He likes it best if you tickle his tummy. Dog, I mean, not father, she laughed. 
She had a lot of long, dark hair and her father's gray eyes and the same quick, dazzling smile. And she was dressed in the narrow silk trousers and flowing tunic that were all the rage in high London that summer. Tom gazed at her in wonder. He had seen pictures of Valentine's daughter, but he had never realized how beautiful she was. Look, she said, he likes you. Dog had ambled over to sniff at the hem of Tom's tunic. His tail swished from side to side in a wet, pink tongue rasped over Tom's fingers. If dog likes people, said Catherine, I usually find I like them too. So come along, father, introduce us properly, Valentine laughed. Well, Kate, this is Tom Natsworthy, who has been sent down here to help, and if your wolf has finished with him, I think we will have to let him get to work, he put a kindly hand on Tom's shoulder. There's not much to be done, we'll just take a last look around the yards and then, he glanced at the note from Pomeroy, then tore it up into little pieces and dropped them into the red recycling bin beside his desk. Then you can go, Tom was not sure what surprised him more, that Valentine was letting him off, or that he was coming down to the yards in person. Senior guildsmen usually preferred to sit in the comfort of the office and let the apprentices do the hard work down in the heat and fumes. But here was Valentine pulling off his black robes, clipping a pen into the pocket of his waistcoat, pausing to grin at Tom from the doorway. Come along then, he said. The sooner we start, the sooner you can be off to join the fun in Kensington Gardens. Down they went and down, with Dog and Catherine following, down past the warehouse and on down twisting spirals of metal stairs to the digestion yards. Where Salt Hook was growing smaller by the minute, all that remained of it now was a steel skeleton, and the machines were ripping even that apart, dragging deck plates and girders away to the furnaces to be melted down. Meanwhile, mountains of brick and slate and timber and salt and coal were trundling off on conveyor belts towards the heart of the gut, and skips of furniture and provisions were being wheeled clear by the salvage gangs. The salvagemen were the true rulers of this part of London, and they knew it. They swaggered along the narrow walkways with the agility of tomcats, their bare chests shiny with sweat and their eyes hidden by tinted goggles. Tom had always been frightened of them, but Valentine hailed them with an easy charm and asked them if they had seen anything amongst the spoils that might be of interest to the museum. Sometimes he stopped to joke with them, or ask them how their families were doing, and he was always careful to introduce them to my colleague, Mr. Natsworthy. Tom felt himself swell with pride. Valentine was treating him like a grown-up, and so the salvage men treated him the same way, touching the peaks of their greasy caps and grinning as they introduced themselves. They all seemed to be called Len, or Smudger. Take no notice of what they say about these chaps up at the museum, warned Valentine as one of the lens led them to a skip where some antiques had been stowed. Just because they live down in the nether burrows and don't pronounce their H's doesn't mean they're fools. That's why I like to come down in person when the yards are working. I've often seen salvagemen and scavengers turn up artifacts that historians might have missed. Yes, sir, agreed Tom. Glancing at Catherine, he longed to do something that would impress the head of historian and his beautiful daughter. If only he could find some wonderful fragment of old tech amongst all this junk. Something that would make them remember him after they had gone back to the luxury of high London. Otherwise, after this wander around the yards, he might never see them again. Hoping to amaze them, he hurried to the skip and looked inside. After all, old tech did turn up from time to time in small-town antique shops, or on old ladies' mantelpieces. Imagine being the one to rediscover some legendary secret, like heavier-than-air flying machines, or pot noodles. Even if it wasn't something that the Guild of Engineers could use it might still end up in the museum, labeled and preserved in a display case with a notice saying, Discovered by Mr. T. Natsworthy. He peered hopefully at the heap of salvage in the skip, shards of plastic, lampstands, a flattened toy ground car. A small metal box caught his eye. When he pulled it out and opened it his own face blinked back at him, reflected in a silvery plastic disc. Mr. Valentine, 
Look, a CD. Valentine reached into the box and lifted out on the disc, tilting it so that rainbow light darted across its surface. Quite right, he said. The ancients used these in their computers as a way of storing information. Could it be important? Asked Tom. Valentine shook his head. I'm sorry, Thomas. The people of the old days may only have lived in static settlements. But their electronic machines were far beyond anything London's engineers have been able to build. Even if there is still something stored on this disk we have no way of reading it. But it's a good find. Keep hold of it, just in case. He turned away as Tom put the CD back in its box and slid it into his pocket. But Catherine must have sensed Tom's disappointment, because she touched his hand and said, It's lovely, Tom. Anything that has survived all those thousands of years is lovely, whether it's any use to the horrible old guild of engineers or not. I've got a necklace made of old computer disks. She smiled at him. She was as lovely as one of the girls in his daydreams, but kinder and funnier. And he knew that from now on the heroines he rescued in his imagination would all be Catherine Valentine. There was nothing else of interest in the skip. Salthook had been a practical sort of town. Too busy gnawing at the old seabed to bother about digging up the past. But instead of going straight back to the warehouse, Valentine led his companions up another staircase and along a narrow catwalk to the incomers' station, where the former inhabitants were queuing to give their names to the clerk of admissions and be taken up to new homes in the hostels and workhouses of London. Even when I'm not on duty, he explained, I always make a point of going down to see the scavengers when we make a catch before they have a chance to sell their finds at the Tier 5 antique markets and melt back into the out-country. There were always some scavengers aboard a catch townless wanderers who roamed the hunting ground on foot, scratching up pieces of old tech. Salthook was no exception. At the end of a long queue of dejected townsfolk stood a group more ragged than the rest, with long, tattered coats that hung down to their ankles and goggles and dust masks slung about their grubby necks. Like most Londoners, Tom was horrified by the idea that people still actually lived on the bare earth. He hung back with Catherine and Dog, but Valentine went over to speak with the scavengers. They came clustering round him, all except one, a tall, thin one in a black coat, a girl, Tom thought although he could not be sure because she wore a black scarf wrapped across her face like the turban of a desert nomad. He stood near her and watched while Valentine introduced himself to the other scavengers and asked, So, have any of you found anything the Historian's Guild might wish to purchase? Some of the men nodded, some shook their heads, some rummaged in their bulging packs. The girl in the blackhead scarf slid one hand inside her coat and said, I have something for you, Valentine. She spoke so softly that only Tom and Catherine heard her. And as they turned to look she suddenly sprang forward, whipping out a long, thin-bladed knife. 